I'd like to begin this particular section by looking at the importance of leaders being present. It's a very, very simple concept and sometimes I think um, not thought about with enough depth. To what extent are we present? Let's take it outside of leadership and just look at our real lives. To what extent are we present in our real lives? To what extent are we actually living a narrative that's running in our head that is about our history, what has happened before? So much of that narrative, even in very um, upbeat people, so much of that narrative when we reflect is on the negative side. What went wrong? What was difficult? What challenges we face? Sometimes we are very negative even about ourselves because of this running, this kind of backing track, I call it, um, that's in our heads all the time about what has happened in the past. Um, it's, not, it's not that the past isn't important, it is. Because we have to learn from the past in order to be in the present and definitely in terms to move to the future. But we take the best from the past. We don't allow the past to be a prison for us. And we understand that in the present, we can change things. We can't change things that have happened, but we can change our reaction to things that have happened. We can move ourselves out of spaces by coming to some kind of resolution over those things that have happened in the past that have held us back. And so in order to be present, we really need, as people of different backgrounds, to be able to take from those backgrounds, but to live in the present. And part of the challenge of living in the present is being our authentic selves. Because perhaps in the past, we were not. One of the papers that I really enjoy looking back on is the paradox of leadership. And you, you can find that in Harvard Business Review and I'm sure it will be amongst the um, papers that you have as part of this course. And I particularly like a quote from the paradox of leadership and uh, especially knowing who the authors were, because the authors are economists, Goffey and Jones. And so these are economists talking about the importance of authenticity and origin. And I think that these are fundamental key issues for us to address in a program such as Bali. And what they say is this, the Oxford English Dictionary defines authenticity, at least in part, as being of undisputed origin. As a result, we think, that is Goffey and Jones think, it is fair to say that no leader will ever succeed in establishing his or her authenticity unless they have effectively understood and managed their relationship with their past and their followers' connections to their roots. So what is it that we can take away from this? Well, I think it's particularly interesting that economists think that authenticity is important. I think it's very interesting that economists think that authenticity is important. And what they're saying about authenticity is that we need to connect with our past, understand, what our narrative means in terms of who we are and what we bring and what our purpose is. And we also need to be aware of that in terms of those that we lead because they too have very strong connections. Remember what I was saying in the first section about all of us being the sum total, if you like, of our upbringing, the way that we were socialized, particularly what we identify with. And identity is always a really tricky issue, isn't it? Because when we talk about identity, um, people tend to think about cultural identity, 
um, and they may not think about the way that we identify in this life or in this world. Let, let me be a little clearer uh, uh, about that because it's all connected with being present. I identify as an African Caribbean woman who was born in the UK and grew up in the UK and did most of my work and my training in the UK. But I identify as an African Caribbean woman. So my cultural heritage is one where I am African and I am gendered and I identify with being a female and I identify with the fact that I grew up in the UK and have different experiences in terms of African Caribbean um, women that I might meet here out in Jamaica. Not everybody identifies the same. You could have somebody who grows up in my family also presents as female also presents as African um, Caribbean in terms of how they look, but they don't identify with that. They don't identify with their gender. They don't identify with their cultural heritage because of upbringing, socialization, whatever. So it's not something to be taken for granted that because you look like this, you identify with whatever this is. It is how you identify as a human being with your history and who you are. So that's the first thing about authenticity, that when we're trying to find our authentic voice, it is the extent to which we identify with all of those things that make us who we are, or we identify with how the world sees us. There are many of us who do not identify with our cultural heritage necessarily. We might say we're more anglicized in terms of the way that we live our lives or raise our children or the things that we are interested in. We, but we don't identify with, 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 with African or Asian culture. That's fine. Everybody has a right to be who they are. But the conflict comes when the world identifies with what they see and think you are. So they see this and they see this and they think, that's an African woman, you don't identify as such, and therefore there is that conflict. So what is authenticity? Authenticity is being true to self, being true to who you are, being true to how you identify, and then as a result of that, being authentic in the present. Now, for me, this presents challenges. You will know that I have spent many, many years talking about the importance, particularly as African people, looking back to our past, partly because there's a little bit of fear in me, if I'm truthful, that we will never be able to relive the greatness of our past. That that which we were, um, we may not be again. And certainly, I, I've kind of given up on that being a reality in my lifetime. But I gain much strength and much inspiration from looking back at what we were as African people because then it enables me to live closer to truth. And living closer to truth is living closer to a truer knowledge of self, uh, self-consciousness. Not the image that is created around you, not what I see on the TV in terms of what African women are supposed to be, but what I know to be true from myself, from my own family, from generations going back, and in terms of what I have read about what our people were and what we, our people could be again. So where I say it presents a challenge in terms of the present is because the present is not presenting the best possible face in terms of who we could be. And so I'm looking back. But I'm looking back not to be trapped by that, but to be inspired by that, so that I can experience the present differently. I can experience the present without fear. I can experience the present by knowing that I do not have to look externally for the divine, because the divine lives within me. I can live in the present 
because I can move from a position of believing something to be so to knowing something is so. And it makes me creative. It makes me get up every day with this old woman's body and have a mind that is creating and thinking and beyond my mind because that's the bit that I think is not developed enough. This beingness, being present, is about understanding the energy that is your body. The intellect is an important part of it, but it's a tiny little bit. We experience things very, very differently when we are really in touch with our entire conscious selves. Um, Na Naeem Akbar says that the human being is um, an intellect, a mind, um, that that person has a soul, a spirit, and that that person has an ancestral and tribal self. We are ancestrally linked. Um, not too long ago, um, Dr. Kofi Annan passed, and it was wonderful to hear the eulogies about Dr. Annan and how much he was revered by world leaders and by anybody who had anything to do with him. Very quiet, statesman-like, um, courageous man in terms of how he wielded not power, but influence. Influence. And this comes from a knowledge of who you are beyond your intellect and beyond your ability to think. You know? Sometimes we don't influence people by the power of our arguments, by you know being reasonable or being articulate. We influence people because our energies just connect and the people know that, you know what, this is right. <laughs> and for people who get to that space in life where they understand that being present and being connected to who they are in their entirety is a very, very powerful space to be then those people can live very, very fruitful and enjoyable lives, even in the midst of chaos. So don't take um, lightly this very, very simple concept of being what it is to be a human being and present. It's something that really, it's not something that you can learn in a leadership classroom or in a lecture theatre. Um, it's something that we can muse on and it would be good to have further discussions on and I hope that after you listen to this presentation you will talk about what it means to shift yourself from a position where you are often looking back, reflecting back, or looking forward. And leaders do have to do all three things. You have to look back, you have to be and you have to look forward. But can we widen the space where we call being? Can we just widen that space? How many of you drove to this session today from your home or yesterday? Or even, uh, let's think about something more normal. Um, drive to work every morning and you get up, you have your rituals that you go through in the morning and you get in your car and you drive to your place of work and you arrive at work and if I asked you to tell me one thing that happened on that journey, you do not know. Because you just arrive, you just move from A to B. You're not present all the time in the car, even probably while you were brushing your teeth, you're preparing for that meeting in your head, you're thinking about what happened yesterday, what happened last week, what the implications are for when you get into work and then you're fearful about the future in terms of, well, what am I going to do to respond to that? And therefore, what are the implications for that in terms of the future? And you, I know I can't be the only one who, for years, traveled to places, and I could not tell you what happened on that journey. I wasn't really present, because we live so much in the past, and we fear so much for the future. So. Being our authentic selves is also about being present in the present. And what makes you a great leader is that you then pay attention to those things that are important. Not politics. 
you play attention to those things that are important in the moment. And for those of us who've ever been in any leadership positions, you know that in order to reach those that you lead, you have to address their most pressing needs. You might have the greatest ideas in the world for we could do this or we could do that. And if people are hungry, I remember as a head teacher, I can't be the only one who set up breakfast clubs for children to have breakfast when they came to school. Why? Because before you could attend to learning, you had to attend to the fact that the children were hungry. And this is in England, you know? And we know that we're not unique. Out here in Jamaica too, we have those sort of things where you have to have breakfast clubs and so on. We bought school uniform at this time of year, you know, at the beginning of September. We knew that a lot of our parents couldn't afford the school uniform. The school uniform was um, uh, cheap, because it was black and white and it was easy. Black, black shirt, uh, black, black trousers, sorry, black skirt, um, white shirts for the girls, white shirts for the boys. So we went to the places where they sold these school uniforms cheap. We bought them as a school and then we sold them to parents so they could pay as little or as much over a period of time and their children could come to school. Now some people will say, you're not social workers, you're running a school. Why are you buying school uniform? Why are you providing breakfast? Because those are the most pressing needs of the children. How am I gonna teach them anything if they're hungry or if they're not even in school because they're not wearing the uniform? And so being present might seem like a simple thing but it is actually a very efficacious thing. Efficacious in that it enables you, it strengthens your ability to make a difference. And to make a difference in terms of things that are meaningful to the people that you serve. And by doing that, you are then able to reach them and connect with them in a way that you need to. So, in summary, in thinking about the whole notion of being present, what is it that I am encouraging black and Asian leaders to do? I am asking you to be present. I'm asking you to be present in your real authentic selves. Sometimes some of the things that you need to critique as in the Seva tradition you will have to critique even in your own language because the, the words in English don't exist for what it is that you're trying to look at. That's what I mean about being present and bringing yourself to the table. And what does that do? It means that there is some additionality that you bring to that place of leadership. And in the slides you will see a quote from Professor Gus John that talks about the additionality that potentially we bring. And potentially it is about humanizing spaces, you know, that we bring a way of behaving, a way of seeing and a way of being that creates a better space for everybody. And what does that mean then in terms of thinking about what you're going to look at after this? Um, which is about being culturally competent, culturally literate. Mira and I have these discussions all the time, and uh, I have come round to Mira's way of thinking and move from cultural literacy to cultural competence. And what is it that we're saying about um, leaders who are culturally competent? Well, first of all, they understand the role of culture in people's lives. And they are cultured human beings themselves. So culture is important because it gives us a way of us understanding how we go about things and making sense of things. And it gives us something to connect to. And when you're dealing with diverse cultures as we are in the UK, when you're providing service to diverse cultures, then as somebody who is culturally competent, as somebody who brings additionality and as somebody who's, who is authentic and comfortable in their own skins, you can counteract some of the negative stereotypes. You can be somebody different
to that which is normally perceived in terms of what it is to be an African Asian leader. You can be somebody who knows about the culture within your communities and are able not only to get them, our communities, to navigate their way through the current terrain, which is challenging, as we've already discussed, but also you can find a way at policy level and at practice level to merge the aspirations of those communities at their best, and I'm not in any way holding up communities as if communities are you know, always wonderful and always functioning. No, they're not. But part of the role of leadership is to deal with that dysfunction, is to navigate that messy space and merge culturally what the organization is doing, what the public service is doing, with what is culturally needed in terms of where the communities are and what they are, um, what, what they aspire to be. And sometimes it is that conversation that helps to raise the level of what could be, where leaders do not play down to the lowest common denominator, but that we raise the level up. We raise the expectations of ourselves up and we raise the expectations of the communities up. But in order for us to do that, we have to be present in terms of their lives. So, read Mira's paper on um, black and Asian leaders missing in action and try not to be missing. Try to be present. But when you come to be present, be present with something of substance. There are a few questions that I have um, posited for you to discuss and, and think about um, as a result of this presentation. And I'm really hoping that in your groups you are able to come to some decisions. But let me just share with you how I have managed to keep myself sane through this journey of um, moving from a position of believing certain things to knowing certain things, finding my authentic self, being comfortable in my own space, understanding that the challenges that we're facing are not just national, regional, but they're global. How have I come to this? Um, the first is to go beyond my training. Um, unfortunately, education has fallen into the position of training and schooling, and it's limiting in terms of us being able to think outside of those parameters. It's very limiting. So I have gone beyond my formal training to a position of learning and constantly learning um, about myself first and foremost before learning about others. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I've actually surrounded myself and connected myself to like-minded people. Like-minded people. And one of the things that I've done really by default, it's not something that I um, set out to do or plan to do, but when I look back over my career, I've also always had a council of elders. I've always revered elders anyway, because within elders there is wisdom and experience and knowledge. And I've always been able to draw on that. So there's always been that. But I've always had my little council of elders. They, they, they weren't labeled as such, but they are people within my life and within my career that I have turned to for counsel. And they have often and always been there. And even now I have um, a council of elders. I will run things by people who then put in and, and enable me to grow. The other thing that I have tried very hard to do is to sedate at least, even if I don't knock it out completely, sedate that constant voice of fear, that constant voice of looking back, that constant voice of um, negativity, and try, try to sedate it, be aware of it, manage it, and live in the present. Be conscious of what I am able to create, what I'm able to do, the difference that I can make. Because trust me, the present is all we have. This moment, that's it. That's all we have. 
So what are we going to do with it? Are we just going to waste it in terms of looking back in fear and looking forward in fear? And you, the, and you know what happens then. You are just crippled. You cannot move. So for me, being present has been key. And being present in my authentic space has enabled me to bring things to the table. And it's not about denying other ways of leadership. It's about saying, I bring something additional. I'm proud of it and it adds value. And all I'm asking you to do is to live your best life as a leader and not be fearful of what it is you bring. So be present.